Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's the shit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's the wet regret. Let's get it. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get clawed to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Cause they wet regret. Let's get it. Yeah. No matter what world you look in, be it movies, TV, video games, or even music, you're bound to find your fair share of tropes. A trope is essentially a device, a motif, or some kind of cliche that, while effective in some cases, can be overused to the point where people roll their eyes. Not that there's anything wrong with that, though. I mean, I love me a good trope. Here, watch my reaction after this next scene. See? That face right there? That's kind of a trope. Wrestling's got plenty of its own creative crutches. Some are so bad they can be immediate channel changers. They can get so bad that Michael Cole might as well look right in the camera to say, just a reminder, everything you're watching here is complete bullshit. And this week, I'm gonna rank them. My picks for the top eight worst tropes in professional wrestling. Number eight, they don't work here. Did you ever have a neighbor who just walked into your house one day and began raiding your fridge or taking showers in your bathroom, and after a few weeks, you just gave up trying to keep them out? No? Well, clearly, you're not a wrestling promotion. Over the last few decades, you can count the number of successful invasion storylines in America on one hand, and even the good ones eventually mellow out, except for some outliers like the original Midnight Express in 87, or Ric Flair as the real world's champion in 91. The concept didn't really come into vogue until May of 96, when Scott Hall kickstarted the NWO invasion. You don't need me to tell you how that ended up. The angle worked so well for WCW, the World Wrestling Federation tried doing one of their own in 98 when the NWA came to town, but that's a story for another time. Within the next few years though, the Federation would try that angle twice more, once with the Alliance and the other time with the actual New World Order. Sadly, neither of those panned out very well. Oh, come on, like that's what they got inducted for, their WWF stuff. Matt Hardy in 2005, The Nexus in 2011, Retribution in 2020, each of these began with a bang as these wrestlers who weren't supposed to be there would instantly make waves. But eventually all these badass invaders just became part of the giant machine, normalized like every other wrestler. They became the very thing they were fighting. Ultimately, a lack of commitment by creative and fans being fully aware these guys were definitely already signed in real life make all these invasion angles sputter out in disappointment time after time. Number seven, waiting for your theme to hit. We've all seen this before. A good guy gets mugged by two or more of the baddies when suddenly the hero's theme blasts over the PA system, heralding the arrival of the babyface rescue. Now this trope obviously works. A well-timed theme song can elicit a massive reaction from the crowd, but when you actually begin to think about it, there are a lot of flaws. Firstly, wouldn't it be poor strategy to broadcast to your enemies you were about to storm the ring? That could easily backfire. Also, what kind of jerk just sits behind the curtain and waits for their first power chords to play before helping their friends? Oh man, that's my tag team partner out there getting beat up, man. Sound guy, I am begging you, pick that shit up. I can't get out there until you play it. All right, let's go, woo! Fuck, man, that wasn't even my song. How could you screw that up? Now I gotta wait even longer. Oh God, they broke his leg, that looks bad. One time on ECW, I saw the Sandman save Tommy Dreamer, but not before he did his entire entrance. The smoking, the beer, the climbing atop a ladder and just sitting on it for a while, as Dreamer got his ass beat the entire time. Depending on your perspective, it's either the worst babyface save in history or the greatest. There's really no in between. I mean, who knows? Maybe the sound guy does have amazing reflexes. Ooh, or maybe the wrestlers are microchip like those old action figures in the Titantron playset. Good times. <laughs> Start something, it all starts with Titantron Live. Number six, the invisible camera. Pro wrestling on television followed a pretty simple sports programming format for many years, switching between matches and ringside interviews with the occasional vignette or video package thrown in for extra seasoning. But from the 90s onward, backstage became all the rage. And not just for locker room interviews, but whole scenes that are played out behind the curtain. But often in the fictional world of wrestling, it's hard to know where the existence of the physical camera begins and ends. Sometimes a wrestler will look right into the lens and acknowledge that it's there, while other times the camera is an invisible observer of every dirty plot and scheme cooked up between wrestlers, and they're usually all shot the same way, and that can be confusing. Look at this famous scene with Batista overhearing Triple H and Ric Flair conspiring against him. You're telling me nobody went to Hunter after that aired and told him Batista was on to him? I mean, we all saw it, right? It was on TV. We were all witness to it. 
Sometimes it's presented as a hot mic before an interview or security camera footage, but for everything else, the camera's existence is never really known. Do they know that we see them or not? I'm not saying that one answer is better than the other, but I would argue you pick one and stick with it. In a business always fighting for credibility, making performers look dumb for revealing their innermost secrets can insult a viewer's intelligence. The way I see it, if a camera's gonna be backstage, there'd better be a good reason for it. Number five, the contract signing. If you need to promote a feud, but you want to phone it in for a week, look no further than this handy dandy booking tool. Contracts, right? Hot damn I love contracts. Sometimes all I want to do after a hard day's work is write my increasingly illegible signature a bunch of times in a row. <laughs> really hits the spot. Sometimes in wrestling, a man's love for a contract is so strong, they gotta share that love with the world. Hence the contract signing. The wrestlers cut a promo, they put pen to paper, they probably fight in the end, rinse and repeat for like two decades. Today, the contract signing has almost become a parody of itself. It's been so overdone, some of the more recent iterations openly acknowledge this trope. By the way, we could have just signed in the back in private. But as I've often said, simply acknowledging the problem exists is not the same as fixing it. I get it, building a program or a match takes time and work, so every now and then you have to dig into the old bag of tricks and pull out some time-tested material. But it's hard to make such heart-pounding action as legal matters attractive to the common fan. Number four. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. The hallmarks of a good baby face are that they're kind, courageous, selfless, and in many cases, trusting to a fault. Now don't get it twisted, there have been plenty of great betrayals on unwitting baby faces from out of nowhere that fans could never expect, but we're not talking about those, we're talking about the easy ones, the betrayals a pomegranate could see coming. Like the fable in which a farmer cares for a frozen snake only to still get bit in the end, far too often we see baby faces getting duped in very obvious and embarrassing ways. This one with the ultimate warrior and Jake Roberts was about as blunt a message as you could get. Reach out for me. I'm a snake. Never trust a snake. One that always jumps out to me is when Vincent Mann betrayed The Rock at WrestleMania 2000. The pairing never made much sense during the build, which made it all the more predictable when Vince turned on the Great One. Though the more I think about it, was it all that predictable that Vince would line up with Triple H and Stephanie after feuding with them for months? I mean, Vince used his own daughter as a pawn to get to Steve Austin, and Stephanie married Triple H to get back at him. So now, Everyone's even and everyone's cool? Then there were the months of buildup between Edge and Christian split during the spring and summer of 2001. I loved this tag team growing up for their great overacting, but that also made them bad at keeping secrets. From the moment Christian was eliminated from the King of the Ring tournament Edge would go on to win, he was dripping with jealousy as Edge just kind of stood there and never called him out on it. The guy might as well have worn a big neon sign over his head saying, Betrayal Alert. Then to make the breakup even more anticlimactic, Christian joined the Alliance, a group of wrestlers from two companies he had zero history with simply because he was a heel and that's just where the heels went back then. Kofi Kingston letting himself get duped by Kevin Owens in 2019, a man whose whole thing was stabbing his friends in the back. You're gonna let your guard down around that guy, let him wear the New Day gimmick? Come on, man. I mean, my God, Sting was the king of being betrayed by his friends. It happened constantly. He vouched for Lex Luger to come to WCW, only to be tricked when Lex joined the Dungeon of Doom. Ric Flair did it to him twice. It became so pervasive, he's since become the poster boy for this trope. These sort of storyline moments aren't career killers per se, but in the moment, they're not great looks either. Why would you let a top guy ignore their intuition or years of booking history because the writer can't come up with a more plausible way to get the feud going? Number three, who is that masked man? Except for that dark time when John Laurinaitis almost exclusively signed wrestlers who could fit into this silhouette, wrestlers by and large have very different appearances and builds and physiques. The top stars often have the most distinct looks, which makes this next trope especially hilarious. It happens sometimes when a wrestler is fired or retires or is on the wrong end of a loser leaves town match. Within weeks, sometimes even days, that wrestler will come back wearing a mask and pretend to be a whole new person despite doing little else to change their appearance and adopting the exact same voice and mannerisms as before. From there, everyone else splits into two distinct camps, the ones who can clearly see through the disguise and know what the wrestler's up to, and the liars who enable the facade. Bullet Bob Armstrong first wore his famous mask to cover up some injuries, before wearing it again to torment Ron and Rob Fuller in Florida. The Midnight Rider must have been the biggest Dusty Rhodes fan in the world, or maybe it was just Dusty Rhodes. Until my man, Dusty Rhodes, 
gets back and I feel a little bit of what he feels. The junkyard dog returned a stagger lead to get back at Ted DiBiase in Mid-South and Brian Pillman adopted the persona of the yellow dog after being driven out of WCW. Jimmy Valiant played Charlie Brown from out of town, a gig that was somehow more dignified than his role in Ultimate Deathmatch 2. Mr. America inexplicably passed a lie detector test to prove he wasn't really Hulk Hogan until he showed everyone that he was and John Cena even worked a house show loop after being storyline fired in 2011 under the clever nom de plume Juan Cena. How would these obvious masked men even get on the roster? There has to be some kind of application process before getting signed, right? You know, credentials, blood work, a social security number at the very least. Who does the promoter write the checks out to? Do these guys get signed sight unseen or do the people in charge just have a real big hunch? Wow, you have the exact same measurements and stats as the guy we just fired. What a coincidence. Welcome aboard. Number two, the foreign menace. A tradition older than wrestling itself, xenophobia. The fear and hatred of things that are different, or in this case foreign, has been an incredible motivator for about as long as humanity's existed. And for as long as pro wrestling's been around, there have always been promoters and bookers all too eager to exploit that fear. For instance, how about the wave of Japanese and German gimmicks that stormed American soil in the years after World War II? Let's not forget the Russians who invaded during much the Cold War, or folks from the Middle East in the 1980s. Of course, there are the wrestlers from our nation's greatest enemy, Canada. Then there are the savages from uncultured lands like Samoa, deepest, darkest Africa, or Red Hook. But heels who are simply heels because they're foreign isn't just some byproduct of the past. In WWE, it's still been going strong all this time. They had La Resistance, Vladimir Kozlov, and Kenzo Suzuki in the mid-2000s. Muhammad Hassan was from America but always talked trash about it. All the racism with none of the guilt. In the last few years, Rusev carried the flag for Mother Russia, and a somewhat recent world champion based his entire gimmick around being from India despite the fact that he's not. You get the idea. It's been done a lot. The basic gist of it is, if these people aren't from America, then they can't be good people. Hell, they're barely people to begin with. The idea is outdated, overplayed, and is insulting to the intelligence of modern fans. Yes, there are plenty of folks who love an excuse to chant USA at a show, but it shouldn't come at the expense of wrestlers who are designed to be reviled simply due to where they're from. And my pick for the number one worst wrestling trope of all time is the authority figure. In the old end days, authority figures in wrestling were almost benign creatures, these plain-spoken and sober-minded administrators of wrestling's rules and regulations. Sometimes there was a figurehead, other times it was just the actual promoter walking out for a second to explain things. But either way, they got in, said their piece, then left so we could all enjoy our wrestles. But that all changed in the 1990s when more authority figures began to insert themselves into storylines. Of course, everyone knows the idea began with Herb Abrams and the Universal Wrestling Federation of the early 1990s. 1990s. Then in 96, Eric Bischoff changed the game by revealing himself to be the man behind the New World Order. Then of course there was the watershed moment of Vincent Mann becoming Mr. McMahon after the Montreal Screwjob. The latter two were part of a huge tapestry of personalities and moments that shaped the Monday Night War and helped wrestling become as popular as it ever would be. And once those angles dried up, what do these creative geniuses, these, these titans of industry do to keep momentum going? Well, you better believe they try that angle again and again and again, hoping it would stick. Since the late 90s, so many wrestling companies have become dependent on authority figures, particularly evil ones, we have seen countless examples of people try to recapture the magic to no success. Eric Bischoff, Dixie Carter, Teddy Long, AJ Lee, Mike Sanders, Jim Cornette, Ric Flair, Paul Heyman, Ernest Miller, Johnny Ace, Vicky Guerrero, Mike Adamley, Vince Russo, Brad Maddox, The McMahon Children, A Laptop, Ben Roethlisberger. How can anyone stay in business with so much turnover in the executive ranks? Then there was the authority, the closest thing modern wrestling's ever had to Mr. McMahon's corporation in terms of storytelling and overall evilness. The only difference is when Vince was in his heelish prime, the audience didn't leave in droves due to terrible writing. There's a whole ass video I did recently about them. I just don't want to talk about them anymore. Only now in the 2020s have things finally begun to slow down. Adam Pierce is the closest thing WWE has to an authority figure these days, now alongside Sonya Deville, who you just know is up to no good. Over in AEW, Tony Khan pipes up on very rare occasions to make matches, but otherwise stays out of the way. It's a lovely change of pace from how things used to be only a few years ago, when companies tried their best to replicate Austin McMahon over and over to no reward. If you want to look at a trope that's been overdone and worn out in a relatively short time frame, the authority figure in wrestling is it. I just wish Jack Tunney and Gorilla Monsoon were still around, man.
But those are just my picks, folks. What do you think are the worst tropes in professional wrestling? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Win, lose, and draw, the kick gloves are off. Mask on like Big Hoss McGraw. The influencer, Zane ain't kicking shot. Cooking it up in the kayfabe kitchen. Wrestling with regret. Let's get it. Ha, yeah. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get Claude to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack?